Welcome back. As China eases COVID restrictions, the Chinese government once again made economic growth a top priority. Certain sectors of the Chinese economy have shown signs of picking up, but others are still lagging behind. How's China's economy faring? Barely a month since the country relaxed its COVID policies. What will a recovery look like? I'm joined in Beijing by Liu Xia, founder and CEO of Cloud Hands Group, and also by Albert Keidel, development economist specializing in East Asia at George Washington University. Welcome to both of you. Welcome to the Hub on CGTN. So Liu Xia, let me start with you. Let's talk about China's economy and its economic outlook. Um, China's economy apparently took a major hit from prolonged pandemic and COVID prevention measures. Um, since China relaxed its COVID policies about a month ago, uh, not even, any indication in your opinion that the Chinese economy is rebounding? Well, people started to welcome the easing, but families and health system were unprepared for the surging in the infections. So people following you has to stay at home, out of work. Therefore, the mobility at a national level has not recovered. Yeah, when uh, we haven't seen the rebounding in the economy, the question comes to when we'll see the uh, rebounding. So I think it depends on two variables. Firstly, um, it depends on China's consecutive approaches or response to the coronavirus related issues. When the coronavirus related issues are under control, um, when the mobility at a national level starts to recover, we will see the pickup in the economy and the um, pickup in the stock market. Secondly, I think the government um, usually have some uh, policies to support the economic downturn and the financial market, say using the monetary policies, financial, uh, physical policies, and industrial policies, especially when the global market is in a recession or in a very slowly recovered pace. So I would be paying particular attention to China's government policies and approaches to support the economy recover um, and to stabilize the financial market. Yeah, thanks for that analysis. Uh, Albert, talking about China's economic outlook um, the coming year, you once said that the, the year 2023 should be a rebound year. There's a lot of stimulus now in the investment. Uh, what have you observed so far regarding the Chinese economy? Uh, what backs such optimism um, for 2023? Well, the optimism comes because of the strength of the underlying Chinese economy. Even though we're now facing this really significant uncertainty around the COVID relaxation. And by rebounding, I'm looking back at 2020 and 2021. Uh, the bad quarter was the first quarter. And yet in the first quarter of 2021, there was 18% growth. So if they're just in calculating year on year growth, if you have uh, a very bad series of quarters in the previous year, and you re you return to close to normal operation, there will be a very high growth rate because it has such a low base in the previous year. So that's the sense of rebounding. But it's premature to say when that would kick in. The official uh, statements are, particularly from Dr. Wu and others, is that it will be springtime, maybe April. I think we just don't know how the uh, waves will spread in the first half of next year. And so the rebound may not be till 2024. But the underlying economy, the strength of investment, it's over 40% of GDP, the work on infrastructure, uh, the, the financial improvements that the government is making, they just announced 16 measures for the real estate sector to strengthen its financing. That process is going to underlie a, a rebound, I think, either in in 2023 or 2024, and the economy will come through. Sure, there's so many variables uh, when it comes to predicting the, the, the trajectory of the Chinese economy. Um, Liu Xia, the world of capital investment is a major barometer of the Chinese economy. Uh, since China relaxes COVID policies, what sectors are being favored by investors? Um, in the last three weeks, we, we, we have seen the short-term hits in the um, financial market um, consecutively because people worried about the condition and the uh, surging in the infections. However, in the last three trading days, I've seen um, there is a big bounce in some sectors. 
um, the big bounces are in the liquor making sector and educational sector. Um, the rebound in the liquor making sector is because the first group of people recovered from the COVID related um, unis um, just started coming back to work, which is expected to uh, stimulate demand. And the educational sector has been supported by the authorities' document. That's the short-term reaction in the market. In the medium term, I think um, the sectors um, will be supported by the government, will be in the strategic industries, say the domestic substitution, um, digital economy, and renewable energy. Um, in the last a few years, the government used a combination of subsidies tax card and industrial policies to support the renewable energy industry. And I see these three strategic industries will be supported by the government continuously. Yeah, it's very important um, to see what comes out of Politburo meetings and all, the, all sorts of work um, meetings of the State Council. Professor Cato, you also noted that investment levels are quite high, particularly in terms of public investments, uh, in what areas have seen have you seen um, you know, recovery gaining momentum? Uh, you talk about infrastructure. Uh, are there other sectors that you think are particularly um, impressive so far, or got potential to um, stir and stimulate growth going forward? Well, I, I think the electric vehicles are are, are natural, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I think, though, that for now, public investment has to be uh, the, taking the lead. Uh, and the private investment, or what I call the for-profit investment, the state enterprises that are working for profit as well as private enterprises, will be looking to see what the demand is for their products. And that's why this counter-cyclical demand capability that China has developed over the recent decades uh, is in its prime right now when China needs it. Uh, so that that I, I think if you just think about what is the market uh, calling for enterprises to do and how are they responding, that kind of misses what's happening right now, which is that there's a, a maybe a lull or a concern in the for-profit sectors in China about where their market's going to be. Uh, this is particularly true of small enterprises that rely on clientele that can get out of their homes and aren't afraid of getting sick. That, that phase is likely to pass. Uh, the CDC and P of China is saying there'll be three waves, right? We're in one right now, uh, which is urban-based. There'll be one when the rural workers return to their homes during spring festival. And then there'll be a third in early March or mid-March when those same rural workers come back into the cities. Uh, and there will be then a, a third surge. And after that, it should settle down. Uh, you know, with the mass infections and hopefully recovery, coming out soon. Um, Liu Xia, you know, so much has been talked about uh, when it comes to a grain recovery and grain finance is playing a key part um, in the process of a grain recovery, if anything. From your personal and professional experience, uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about the grain finance landscape in China. How has it progressed over the years, especially in the past year, against the odds? And how do you see its potential um, post-COVID? Um, I see China has been working so hard to drive the economy from the uh, energy intensive or fossil fuel energy intensive industries, uh, which needs the support of financial um, instruments and services. So I see the green finance is a critical tool um, in the green economy. Uh, some companies will find um, green a securitization, bring asset back the securities helpful as a financing tool. So um, bring securitization is making an asset, a liquid asset or a series of liquid asset transforming into a security. Um, with green bonds and green uh, asset back securities, we've seen in China, um, the total value of this um, is more than uh, 400 billion uh, the first half of 2022, which picked up um, uh, more than 64% one year ago, making the total into slightly more than 1 trillion. So I think um, in the green finance world, um, China's economy will be picked up quickly by those green financial instruments, green financial um, services.
Albert, according to Trip.com, a Chinese travel website, a very popular website, from December the 7th through 18th, flight bookings to the tropical island province of Hainan rose by nearly 70% from the month earlier. Of course, that was based on a very low base. And then Hainan hotel bookings last week rose by 20% from the week before. Um, when do you expect the free movement of people, as indicated by the tourism sector, well, I think this is understandable now that people can move freely. Some people are just not going to be worried about getting COVID, and that'll be a, maybe a small share, but of a very big population. So there will be a huge uh, uptick in travel. And I think when the weather gets warmer in the springtime, we will see really a strong return of people traveling to summer places or places that they want to go back and see family or just international travel. I'm quite confident the weather will return to pre-COVID levels by the summertime. I'm not sure, but I would think certainly by 2024. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was uh, next next year in, in the summertime. Albert, uh, you wrote a book about China and its economy. It's named China's Economic Challenge, Unconventional Success. It was published recently. Um, uh, maybe you can tell us a bit about the main arguments and main findings of that book. Well, the main argument is that China has used a number of unconventional steps as far as the mainstream thinking in developed countries is concerned to really push its economy so that it's had 40 fold growth in, 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 in 40 years, just a remarkable growth experience. And because of that growth, it's been able to reduce poverty at a, at a dramatic pace, uh, really enviable for poor countries around the world. And the secret of this in my mind is first, uh, high investment rates, high share, above 40% of GDP, and counter-cyclical demand. So you need the supply push to increase capacity, which is the investment side, and then you need to manage demand. Uh, and you need to keep demand strong, you need to try to control inflation, and there are a series of capabilities that China has developed, uh, and which I describe in my Ch China's Economic Challenge. Dual circulation uh, is another word for, notice we're going to rely on domestic more, if not uh, as much as, as international demand. And there's a really interesting development right now. After the US midterm elections, there seems to be a relaxation of international interest in China. We've seen you know, the German uh, visitors coming. We saw the, the EU commissioner president was here. Uh, the president of France is coming. We've just seen the Australian foreign minister visiting China. So there seems to be a bit of a thaw because before the US midterm elections, China was a real domestic US issue. And so now that uh, actually the Democratic Party has done so well, uh, that has eased a bit. And so that should also help on the international demand side. I mean, yes, there may be a recession, but the demand for Chinese products, manufactured products in particular, uh, has been pretty steady from the U.S. It fluctuates uh, in other parts of the world. So I, I'm really, I, I think that that approach, uh, it's multifaceted. It, it focuses on demand and the book describes mm -hmm. how China steps uh, to facilitate, particularly the financial sector. It, it, you don't just liberalize, you manage it strongly. There are a whole series of steps in the book that describe what China has done successfully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, geoeconomics is a very important way to look at uh, the economic patterns. And uh, Lucia, finally, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, from the vantage point of an investor, how do you see the importance of international cooperation when it comes to fighting climate change? You know, we've been talking so much about climate change, but how important is international cooperation in that regard? Um, I think uh, in the recent years, especially this year and last year, China, US, China, EU's relationship and cooperation has been frozen for a while because of the um, political issues, geopolitical issues, um, the economic problems. Um, however, I think climate change um, issues or talks uh, keeps being the clue of the China, US, China, EU relationship. Uh, secondly, I think there's so much China could learn from the US and EU on climate change issues. Say, for example, from the US, how to develop the renewable EV cost industries um, to make the uh, deployment increasing while protecting the rainforest. Uh, from EU, as EU has been the leader in the climate change um, uh, for the last two decades uh, in terms of ideas and actions, China could learn so much from EU's experiences. I believe China has the potential to uh, drive the um, economy up uh, 
especially from the old mode of the economy to the new mode of the green finance economy. Um, and I believe China will have the potential to be the engine of the global economy once again. All right. Thanks so much, Duxia and Professor Albert Kaida. That's all the time we have. Thank you all. Thank you both. Thank so you, Wang Great. Thank you. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.